Our voices. Our stories. Our community. Hi, I'm Tim Doucette, and I'm a blind astronomer. When I was a kid, my fascination was with the moon because that was the brightest thing in the sky. And uh, I always used to love to look at lights. They think it's something that is, is kind of inherent with my eye condition. As a child, I was born with congenital cataract and I was blind for the first year and a half of my life. They realized I could see because there was a teddy bear on the side of my crib and there was a light bulb and I was reaching for the light bulb. <laughs> So I think that's where my fascination with the moon. I'm using Deep Sky Eye Observatory as a, an educational channel, if you will, um, by providing tourist experiences, you know, introduce them to the world of astronomy and the night sky. Deep Sky Eye Observatory is more than a telescope, a building and campsites on Tim's family land. Visitors become mesmerized by what they once thought was unreachable, an experience of the deep cosmos. The observatory's unique location in one of the darkest skies in the world alters the senses as the ground beneath disappears and the universe opens up. In this rural piece of paradise in southwest Nova Scotia, Tim and his family are building a tourist experience like no other, with camping under the stars, guided starlight tours, and a view of celestial bodies that can only be seen through a high-end telescope. They're preserving an experience that is withering away as the light of cities pushes the night sky farther and farther. My role, I think, more is an educator, a person to open the door to other people to inspire them so that they could go on to do other things. If it wasn't for astronomy and a space program and all of these things, you know, you wouldn't have a cell phone, you wouldn't have GPS, you wouldn't have X-ray technology. It all stemmed from, you know, people looking up at the sky. By looking up there, you start to understand what we have here. Tim's eye condition gives him a special ability to see dark sky better than almost anyone on the planet. He was born to be an astronomer. I feel I do have astronomy eyes, definitely. As a baby is, is young, the first six months of its life, that's when the eye really develops. It was a year and a half before they discovered that I had the congenital cataracts. So I kind of missed that stage. I was left with about 10% of my eyesight. Cataracts form on the lens of the eye, inside the eye. So you need something to focus the light onto the retina. What they've done for me is they've had to remove that because it's, it was severely damaged. And that did a couple of things. The lens of the eye is a natural filter for ultraviolet light. Since I don't have that filter, I'm able to perceive a little bit of ultraviolet light more than everybody else. The other side effect is um, they have to widen the pupils. So my pupils are permanently dilated, so they let in a lot more light than the average person. Normally, the pupil will open when there's not much light in the area. But if it's you know, really bright out, the pupil will close and let less light in. For me, it's permanently open, so everything I look at is extremely bright, which lends itself very well for nighttime and astronomy. Being able to see the night sky, especially the, you know, the first time I was really exposed to the whole Milky Way. For me, it was kind of an awakening to realize what I had. I was 16 years old. I had lost about 5% of the 10% that I had uh, because the cataracts came back. So I went for a surgery and that's when they removed the lens of the eye and widened my pupil. That was the first time. So when I came home from Halifax, it was dark, and I got up out of the car and I just kind of stretched my back a little bit. I looked up at the sky and I said to mom, I said, I think I'm having a detached retina. Mom's like, no, no, that's the stars. I'm like, what? It was like, holy, like, you know, for so the first time, I'm able to see this 
picture of stars. I knew someday that astronomy was going to play a role in my life. I just didn't know when or how. It is a very rare condition and anytime people have cataracts now, they just replace the lens. I wouldn't say I'd be the last person with this condition, but I'm guessing that the percentage is around 2%, um, even maybe now down to 1% for people that have this kind of condition. An hour and a half's drive away from Deep Sky Eye, in the seaside fishing town of Brighton, Nova Scotia, a little girl shares the same rare eye condition as Tim. My name is Charlie Morehouse. I am nine. When I was young, everything was blurry. We had to go to the eye doctor and get glasses. Shaylee has bilateral congenital cataracts. She recently developed glaucoma about a year and a half ago. She was on the waiting list to have the artificial lenses put on her eyes, but her pressures got too high and too uncontrollable for her to have them done, so she's not a candidate to have them anymore. I don't think there's any other child in our county that has restrictions like Shaylee does. And finding out that Tim is 100 kilometers away from us and has the exact same condition as my daughter. I've always wanted to talk to somebody about it to see what their life was somewhat like growing up and coming into adulthood um, and what to expect maybe. One, two, three, four, five, six. Which is? Twelve. Right. My favorite subject are math and gym. When I grow up, I would like to be a math teacher. My favorite thing is to ride my bike. I ride my bike with my brother. Waylon and Shaylee are my twins. They have a pretty special bond. They genuinely love each other. Not only that, they're best friends. Her vision is not as good as mine. Sometimes if I like see something and I point it to her, she can't see it sometimes. Like if it was a white plane up in the sky and I tell her there's a plane, and then I point at it, she won't be able to see it. How does it make you feel? Sad sometimes. I just hope Shaylee can live a normal life. I hope that she can live on her own. I hope she can get married, have kids. Um, hope she can have a career. She wants to be a teacher. I hope she can do that. <laughs> and I'll help her as much as I can. <laughs> Our community will return after the break. We now return to our community. When Shaylee first got her glasses, when we were outside at night, she looked up and she was like, Mommy, what's that? And I didn't realize she'd never really seen the moon or stars before. And she didn't know what it was, which was pretty amazing. Um, it actually made me cry. I don't normally look up at the sky because I don't really look through telescopes. I think there's probably a thousand stars up there. <laughs> if Shaylee is able to see the night sky through deep sky eye, I think she's gonna love it. I do. Tim lives in one of the darkest sky areas of North America. Though he didn't move there for astronomy, generations of his family have long since lived in this remote part of southwest Nova Scotia. I live in uh, Quinnan, Nova Scotia. Quinnan is God's country out in the sticks. 
um, small community of about 200 people. Very uh, old-fashioned, if you will. You know, we just got high-speed internet a few years ago. It's a nice rural community. My family have lived here five, six generations or more. I know my great-great-great-grandfather would have been here on, on this road. Hence the name Fronten Road, and it would be on my mom's side. I knew since I was a child that this was a dark sky. There was no street lights, no light pollution. I knew it was a prime spot for stargazing. Before my grandfather passed away, he was going to leave me the house. Uh, and I told him, I said, you know, I don't think it's a good idea because I'm not here. I work in, this, in the city, right? That type of thing with computers and all that. And I said, uh, my brother is more suited to take care of the home and he's a carpenter and he lives nearby. And so he's like, yeah, he said, probably. But he said, you never know. I guess it would have been close to 10 years later that uh, we decided to move here. I've been working with a bunch of individuals who assist in preserving the night sky. We've gotten these designations uh, from the Starlight Foundation as a Starlight Tourist Destination and a Starlight Reserve. Progress Report, June 2017. Deep Sky Eye Observatory has received 200 visitors in its first year of operation. The observatory continues to grow with the addition of camping sites. Deep Sky Eye's bubble tent campsites have a clear plastic roof so people can sleep under the stars. Tim wants his guests to gain appreciation for the night sky and become inspired to preserve it. It's important to me to preserve this place as a dark sky area because there's fewer and fewer places in the world that have these conditions that are ideal for stargazing. We've been recognized by the Starlight Foundation to have a very pristine sky. And to me, everybody deserves the right to view the night sky. We looked around our area, scouting out places to build an observatory. And uh, my brother offered, he said, well, I have a beautiful you know, spot on top of the hill that's like 150 feet above the ground. So I said, well, that would be perfect. So that's kind of where we chose the spot on top of the hill. The observatory, I designed it for certain little things. I wanted to have a place where I could teach and a place where I could stargaze through a telescope. I wanted a telescope where I didn't have to climb a ladder to look through the eyepiece. We had the dome not very high up from the floor. The dome itself that I have is a homemade constructed dome. It basically sits on top of rollers that roll on a little track, so you move it with your hand. I'm using a computer that's sort of in another room, underneath the telescope room, to control it. Powering on. The telescope talks as well. I use a wireless game controller. I can just kind of press a bunch of buttons and telescope moves. You know, people are like, wow, that's kind of neat. When I'm upstairs with the guests, I usually have my iPad with me, and I've set up a pre-list of things that we're going to look at. We have some speakers to play some music and have a nice under-the-stars experience. Select alignment. Solar system alignment. Align successful. The telescope in the observatory gathers about 3,000 times more light than your eye can you're able to see some pretty awesome objects that are far away. Venus. Mars. The Perseus double cluster is two groups of stars that are close together and they appear blue colored. And the cool thing about those is that even though when you look through a telescope and they're blue, they're actually not blue stars, they're actually more white stars. They're moving in space together and they've been traveling so fast and for so long that they're actually blue shifted. So basically what happens is the blue light is getting to us before the red light. So if that cluster of stars were to whip by us, we would actually be looking at them and they'd be red in the back. 
The Orion Nebula is one of the most spectacular nebulas for us in the Northern Hemisphere to observe. It is in the Orion constellation, a cloud of gas and dust that's lit up by the surrounding stars. And actually in my telescope appears almost a purple color. In 2017, I was visiting Nebraska and took a photo of the solar eclipse. If there's one thing that you do in your life is to experience a total solar eclipse, whether you're blind or not. Even those who are totally blind would find it a pretty incredible experience. The planet changes. All the birds go to their nests. The crickets start chirping. Basically, the animals are tricked into thinking that it's nighttime. So everything kind of starts to shut down. And in two and a half minutes, it reverses back and temperature starts to go up. It was very incredible. It's really important to me to encourage people who are visually impaired to come to the observatory and view the night sky because it can be a challenge to grasp. Describing it is one thing, but seeing a part of it that you know, you've never been exposed to kind of opens up your view. When I heard about Shaley and her eye condition, I was actually quite excited uh, because her eye condition sounds uh, very similar to, a, if not to a T, uh, to exactly what I have. So it'll be very interesting to, to meet Shaley and to uh, get her to, to look through the telescope and show her a few things. Our community will return after the break. We now return to our community. Tim invited Nancy, Waylon, and Shaley to Deep Sky Eye Observatory to teach them about the night sky and to share his own story of growing up partially sighted with Shaley. Welcome to Deep Sky Eye Observatory. I'm Tim, and I hope you guys will have a fun time tonight. You're going to learn a lot of cool things, see a lot of cool things. Hopefully, you'll end up with something to go home with that you can remember this place and remember the universe and the stars. So, are you ready? I'm ready. Ready to get going? Ready. All right, we're ready. I'm, ready. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about Deep Sky Eye Observatory. Imagine yourself way back in grade six. What grade are you guys in? Four. Four, Four. okay. Well, imagine yourself when you get a little bit older or even imagine yourself right where you are right now in what, in what class you're in. Well, when I was in grade six, I used to love looking at magazines or a book and seeing an astronomer or an astronaut. Well, I wanted to be one of those. I wanted to be an astronomer, an astronaut. Well, what happens if somebody, maybe a family member, maybe your teacher, or maybe a close friend, what if they told you that you were never gonna be able to do that in your life? How did that make you feel? Sad. Pretty sad, eh? Well, let me tell you, that's how my life started when I was your age. Because I was born totally blind. I had no eyesight for the first year and a half of my life. I had congenital cataracts. And very few people in the world actually have this condition. And from what I understand, somebody in this room has that. <laughs> so it's kind of special and I'll explain a little bit. Now I was really interested in being an astronomer and an astronaut and you know all that sort of thing when I was a kid but I was discouraged and one night when I went stargazing my friend said look through the telescope and tell me what you see. So I said ah oh. I said I see a donut I see two little dots and I see this like kind of pool of water in the middle and he said, um, you should not be able to see that with this size telescope. And I said, well, I'm the blind one. What are you talking about? So I didn't understand why I could see that and he couldn't. Well, what I found out is the lens of your eye is a natural filter for ultraviolet light. What happened with me is my lenses were removed and they couldn't put new ones in. So, what that means is I don't have that filter anymore for ultraviolet light. 
So I'm actually able to see in the ultraviolet a band of light. So looking through a telescope at a certain objects, those objects emit that type of ultraviolet light. I never let anything stand in my way and I never let anybody tell me what I could and could not do ever again. Good for you. This light is an ultraviolet light. Now the reason you can see it up above your head is because your eyes are a little bit more sensitive than everybody else's eyes. So you have a superpower. Yeah. You can see light that other people can't. Yeah, pretty neat, eh? I don't get that. Uh, no, it's just the way you are. And it's an awesome gift because I know only one other person in the world that has that. When you get a chance to look through a telescope at certain things in the night sky, you might be able to see it better than everybody else that you know. Really? Yeah. You might. Yeah. Pretty neat, eh? It's kind of a neat trick. Yeah. <laughs> Light on. Watch your eyes. I'm just going to have a quick peek and see what's going on outside here. Oh, Luna. Here we are, Luna. Mars, Jupiter, Venus. All kinds of stuff out here. Oh, yeah. So we're going to have a look at the moon. That sounds weird. It's the motors turning of the telescope. So all I'm doing is I'm controlling it with the controller. That's cool. Neat, eh? Where do you look through? All right, I'm going to move the telescope. What? And the dome. Watch your hands on the side. You don't want to be putting them by the rail. There we go. Oh, what a beautiful moon. I don't see no moon. Oh, you will. Come on, have a look over here. Tell me what you see. Back up a little bit. Let me adjust it. There, get a little bit closer. What do you see, Waylon? Craters. A whole bunch of spots. Cool. All right, let's see. Shall we? All right. Come on this side. Also look right in here. See it? Yeah. Whoa. What do you see? Craters. You see all these little spots? Yeah. And that little spot that you're looking at on the moon is, I would say, it's about the width of the province of Nova Scotia. That's cool. That's cool, eh? I thought I wouldn't be able to go that close. It gets a lot closer as well, yeah. I liked everything. I've never seen anything like that before. It's a relief, really, to know that he leads a normal life. For not knowing anybody with the same condition as Shaylee, that's huge for me. I asked her mom, I said, was she bullied? You know, was she, you know, how's she going up in school? And in some parts of it, I could relate. And I said, you know, I said, it'll be okay. You know, good thing is she has her brother to help out. My favorite part was looking at the moon really close. It makes me very hopeful that Shaylee will have maybe the same kind of success in maybe a different field or whatever she chooses to be. A normal life is all I want for Shaylee. I really hope that I've been able to give her a little bit of, you know, my experience. I can't wait to see what she does. Producer-director Brad Rivers, cinematographer Mike Zakchewski, camera operators Brad Rivers, Martin Noel, editors Brad Rivers, Manuel Grados Andrade, sound Brad Rivers, Saljan Heishi, Martin Noel, integrated described video specialist Simone Cupid, narrator Jim Van Horn, senior producer Jennifer Johnson, production supervisor Janice Sevatilli, director production Kara Nye, director programming Brian Perdue, vice president programming and production John Melville, President and CEO David Arrington. Copyright 2018 Accessible Media Inc.